Habakkuk or Habakkuk actually means to embrace, to wrestle. Or if you're from uh, some parts of Texas, wrestle. But uh, anyway, it means to grab hold of and struggle with something. And this is what Habakkuk is doing. He is grabbing hold of the situation that's around him and he finds himself struggling with it. He's a man of faith. He's God's man, but he has some questions. And sometimes that's just like us too. And it amazes me whenever I look at him describe the scene back in Israel at that time and see how closely it parallels uh, today what Habakkuk was experiencing back then and what was grieving him is the same sort of stuff that grieves me and sure grieves you. I'm sure grieves you as you look around and look at the news even today. In fact, I'm going to read this again to you, the first four verses. And it says it's the burden of Habakkuk. And sometimes God will just place a burden on your, on your heart. He'll help you see something and see that it's just wrong so that you will pray about it. And so you will seek his face about it and ask him what needs to be done. And so the Lord gave Habakkuk this burden. And he says, here's what Habakkuk said. Lord, how long do I have to call out for help? Why don't you listen to me? How long must I keep telling you that things are terrible? Why don't you save us? Why do you make me watch while people treat others so unfairly? Why do you put up with the wrong things they are doing? I have to look at death. People are harming others. They are arguing and fighting all the time. Does that sound familiar to you? Looks like just right out of the newspaper or uh, social, uh, uh, whatever the different things are. What do you call those? Social what? Social media. Uh, all this, everywhere you look, this stuff's going on. They are arguing and fighting all the time. The law can't do what it's supposed to do. Fairness never comes out on top. Sinful people surround those who do what is right. So people are never treated fairly. This is the situation that Habakkuk looked around and he saw. And these are supposed to be God's people. And it just grieves him that his society has gotten to this point. And so he cries out to God and he has been crying out to God. We can tell because he says, how long do I keep even having to ask you about these things, Lord? The situation is so, so similar. And so here we have Habakkuk who knows and believes in God, but he can't understand what's going on. He can't understand why God is allowing his people to behave like they are. He has questions. Why is God allowing this? And then why isn't he doing something about it? He just flat says, God, why are you doing anything? And then God responds. And we're going to be looking at his response later, but... To sum up his response in one word and two words, God says, I am. Whenever he's saying, why aren't you doing something? Why don't you do something? His response is, I am doing something. How many times do you wind up in situations where if you really listen, as you're just frustrated with the way things are going in your own life, and you cry out to God, you say, God, why don't you do something? He says, I am. All through scripture, it's amazing how the, the answer is his name. I am. 
Whenever Moses asked him, who shall I say sent me? He says, say, I am sent you. And sometimes you may think God's not doing a thing. And then you start talking to him and he says, yes, I am. I am doing something. Well, God responds whenever you have questions. And I want you to know if you have questions, please take them to God. Ask God. He doesn't mind you asking him questions. He doesn't mind you trying to understand. He wants you to understand because the more you understand, the more fully you can be his in the moment and you can be his witness in the moment. Now, there are different ways to ask questions or different kinds of questions to ask. First of all, uh, I'll use uh, two examples. First of all, Uh, When the birth of Jesus was being announced, first of all came the announcement of the birth of John. If you'll remember, Elizabeth, uh, Jesus' aunt, had been barren, and they'd been praying and praying for a child. And then Zechariah, his father, was was the temple priest. He was going into the temple, not the temple. Well, it was the temple. He was going into the Holy of Holies. He was... Uh, taking the sacrifice in and the angel Gabriel appeared to him and told him about the son he was getting ready to have. And Zechariah's question to the uh, angel, to Gabriel, was, how am I going to know this is really going to happen? And this, you got to understand who he's talking to. He's talking to Gabriel. And you can tell Gabriel gets kind of miffed at him for even asking the question. How's he going to know it's going to happen? Well, first of all, he's going to know it's going to happen because his wife's going to conceive a child and she hasn't been able to do that. I mean, it's kind of the answer's kind of there, you know, in the message that's given. If you'll just watch Zechariah, you'll find out whether it's true or not when it happens. But instead, this mighty angel that stands by the throne of God says, basically, you know what I, who, you know who you're talking to? You know who you're questioning here? And he tells him, here's how you'll know. You're not going to be able to let another word, another, another word is not going to come out of that mouth of yours until after you name this child. And that's how he knew. All right. But he asked a question. He got an answer. But it was a question of doubt. And there's a difference in doubting and having struggles with faith. There's a difference. And it's when you're struggling in your faith and you're trying to understand, that's different. Now, Mary, same angel, appears to Mary. Gabriel appears to Mary. And her question is, how can these things be? How is this going to come about? Not is it going to, how can I believe it? But I just don't understand how this can be. And so Gabriel, who is so impatient, it seemed like with uh, Zechariah, takes time to explain to Mary exactly how this is going to come about. And Mary's response is, be it done unto your maid as the Lord wishes. Well, Big difference, two questions. One was a question of doubt, but if you, like I say, there's a difference between a question of doubt and uh, trying to understand. And so, uh, another thing is points of view. Sometimes you cannot understand a situation and you'll try to understand the situation, but you try to do it in your own steam and in your own intellect and you will start looking for answers and you and if that's what you're doing you can study you can assume you can postulate theories and you can try to test them and I've known some people that are good Christians that will not think to ask God for help in understanding something instead I think they just love to study There's some people just love to study, but you're not going to find the answer for sure until you get God involved in it because he's the one 
that's in charge of everything. And he does want to work with you and he wants you to work with him. So the other way, instead of uh, trying to understand in your own steam, in your own way, is to try to understand by asking God what's going on and prayerfully looking at his word and prayerfully looking at the situation around you. Habakkuk knew God's word. He knew the history of God's people, and he still just couldn't understand what was going on. And so he asks, and God answers. If you have questions, God does have answers. He wants you to ask. In fact, Jesus told us, ask and be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you. Now, I want you to know that often when things look the bleakest, when it looks like God's not doing anything, and you can be either so frustrated or so scared or so disappointed or feeling so helpless and hopeless because it seems like God's just not doing anything and it seems like he's not paying any attention, often that is when God is doing his greatest work. If you don't believe me, look at the cross. Look at the cross. There was a time when the disciples just thought it was all over. They had spent three years trying to understand this man, Jesus, trying to uh, find out what really he was all about. And he did his best to try to explain it all to them. He laid it out to them. They never could really grasp it. And then he winds up hanging there on a cross, crying out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? If they'd had any hope up till that moment, that probably dashed it. When their leader was calling out in desperation. And it seems that God has totally left him. And yet at that moment, that's at the very moment, at that darkest moment, God was about his greatest work, reconciling you and me to him. He was doing a work that reached into the pit of hell and up to the highest part of heaven. And it appeared that he just wasn't even paying any attention. If you're in a place to where it just seems that God's forgotten you, if you're in a place where it seems like there's just no hope, and you're just feeling so helpless, and you're crying out, and you're saying, God, why aren't you doing anything? His answer to you this morning is, I am, I am. He is at work. I remember listening to one of the greatest preachers in the Texas Annual Conference at one time. He was he well he was the president of Wiley College, Dr. Dr. Robert E. Hayes, Sr. Not Junior, but Dr. Robert E. Say. Now Dr. Robert E. Hayes Jr. is now, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest preacher. But Dr. Hayes Sr was uh, one of the big boys. Whenever I was starting out, he was a dignified man with a stained glass voice. And oh my goodness, he was so impressive and he was so learned. And I just loved to hear the man talk. I loved to watch him walk. He was just a great guy all the way around. And he went through a tough, tough time at Wiley. When he wound up uh, being under investigation by the Internal Revenue Service, he stood up at annual conference and stood behind the pulpit at First Methodist in Houston and shared what he went through about how things just kept getting worse and worse and worse and everybody deserted him. Even his preacher friends began to question his innocence 
And he knew he was innocent. He knew he'd done done nothing wrong. And yet they just kept digging. And even his friends, many of them deserted him, just like they deserted Jesus when he was hanging on the cross. He said it was a tough, tough moment. He said, but I want you to know something. You got to go good through Good Friday to get to Easter and Easter is going to come. And he went on and he shared about how after it finally came down to it and it went to trial, the judge took the uh, indictment. He took all the evidence and he looked at it and he looked at the IRS officers that were bringing the charges against him. And he said, shame on you. Shame on you for doing this to this good man. There's no evidence here whatsoever. And he threw the whole thing out. And then it was over. And he was exonerated. And everything was okay again. Easter came. But you got to go through Good Friday sometimes in order to get to Easter because God has a work that can only be done in the dark where you can't see and where you can't understand. And so I just want to remind you and encourage you to hang on, hold on. You're in Good Friday now, but Easter is coming. In our country, it looks bad right now, but God is doing a work in our country. It's up for us to try to start understanding what's really going on instead of just assuming that we know what's going on. If we look on it at one level, we can see one thing. But if you start looking at it from God's level, you're going to see something else. God is at work. And we're going to talk next week and the week after about what's going on. And we're going to talk about what's our part in all of this. But this morning, this morning, the message is, hang on, God's at work and Easter is coming. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.